to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. These are the words of Ananias to Saul of Tarsus when Saul asked, Lord, what would you have me to do? We're so glad that you joined us today for our study of the book of Acts. We're thinking today in Acts chapters 20 through 22. And so if you, have, you don't have your Bible, we want you to pause for just a moment, locate your Bible, get it handy, as we're going to look to the Word of God in this exciting and wonderful stu study of the action-packed book of Acts. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit with them. If you're looking for a congregation to worship with, you haven't found a place to, to worship God, visit the Church of Christ in your area. You will find people there who love God, who are concerned about lost souls, and who want to know is there any word from the Lord? If you'd like to study more, they'd be happy to sit down and talk to you about God, His plan of salvation, worship, whatever it may be. I promise you, you will find kind, loving people at the Lord's church who will be thrilled for you to stop by and visit with them. Friend, also here at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you in your desire to draw near to God. Won't you visit our website? thegospelofchrist.com. Uh, from there, you can access all our Bible study material. We have audio lessons, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, uh, written material, just a wide variety of good Bible study material that would help you in your desire to come closer to God. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of this eight lesson series on the book of Acts, we're happy to make that available to you free of charge. Just go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can fill out a meet, look for our media, free media request form. Fill that out. Let us know how you'd like to receive that material. Uh, easiest way is through a digital download you can receive instantaneously. Or if you need it in audio, we can get you a digital audio file. Or if you'd like to have a copy of a DVD for video, we can mail that to you as well. We'd love to help you in any way we can in your desire to know God better. Uh, check us out on Facebook, like us and follow us. A great way to keep up with what we're doing. Also, in the respective Play Stores, we have uh, the Gospel of Christ app for smartphone. Great way to study the Word of God. In our fast-paced world where everybody seems to have a smartphone, a great tool there for Bible study also. Again, we're just so glad that you've joined us, especially today as we're thinking in Acts 20 through 22 about the great question that you find throughout the book of Acts. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? As we turn our attention to Acts chapter 20, Paul is continuing his effort now to take the gospel to the uttermost part of the world. As he does that, he now comes to Troas and other areas. And in the face of, of some of the discouragement, fall and temptation fall, Paul has been facing, he now realizes he's got to keep pressing on. Look at Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse number 1, at the mentality and mindset of these evangelistic workers. After this great uproar that occurs in Ephesus, where the whole city is in an uproar, the Bible says, after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And so Peter of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, Gaius of Derby, Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia, these men going ahead 
waited for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now, why in the world does God tell us all this incidental information? Well, friend, look at the efforts. The whole city of Ephesus is in an uproar. There's been good that was done. People burned their magic books. The word of the Lord grew and prevailed. People are converted to the gospel, but there's an uproar that takes place as well in the face sometimes of, of discouragement and problems. This teaches us that Paul and his company kept pressing on with the gospel. In one city, Maybe they reached a point they did all they could do, and the church there would have to work with and do the rest, and they went on. Friend, we learn that as Christians, we keep pressing on. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, Paul said, I press on toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This reminds me of what Jesus would say to in the limited commission, we send the 70 out. If they won't receive you, shake the dust off your feet, go somewhere else. That doesn't mean those people aren't worthy and don't need to hear the gospel, but there's only a certain amount of good that can be done by one person. Somebody else can might do good, but you go on and preach the gospel. And friend, anytime we face discouragement and temptation, we need to remember that there are other people in other places who need to hear the gospel, who want to hear the gospel, and who are open to hearing that. Now watch what happens next. When Paul leaves this area, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, he is now leaving that area, and look what happens as he's in Troas, about ready to leave. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. And so as he's in Troas, he gathers with the church. It's interesting here, several things happening. The church is gathering on the first day of the week. That, that, that's the day that Jesus rose. That's the day that Christians are commanded to come together, 1 Corinthians 16, every first day of the week, verses 1 and 2. And what are they coming together for? Christians are gathering together on the first day of the week to worship. Paul preaches to them. But there's something interesting that happens here. They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. You see, when Christians come together, part of that, a big part of that, is to remember Jesus' death. 1 Corinthians 11, some were taking advantage of that, and Paul said, when you come together, it's not for that purpose, and it should be. And so a big part of the purpose of coming together is we remember the Lord's death. How do we do that? By the breaking of bread. Symbolic of communion. 1 Corinthians 10 uh, the, the bread that you break, is it not the body of Christ? The cup that you drink, is it not the blood of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we break that bread, we drink that cup in an unworthy manner. So breaking of bread is representative in the New Testament of the communion that Christians partake of. Jesus instituted that at that Passover in Matthew 26. When he took that fruit of the vine, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many. For the forgiveness of sins, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And so Christ commanded it. We come to, Christians are commanded, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we're to come together every first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, when we come together every first day of the week, we're to break bread, we're to take of the Lord's Supper. Now, friend, I want you to think about this just a moment. Oftentimes, Many religious groups uh, will say that communion is not to be done every week or it doesn't matter when you do it. A lot of places do it on Easter and Christmas. Sometimes people do it once a month. What does the Bible say about that? Acts 20 verse 7. Christians came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Their purpose for coming together was to remember the Lord's death, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and they came together every first day of the week. And so when we put all the information together, we realize that we ought to be partaking of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Let me give you a parallel. Think about this with me. Exodus 20, verse 8. God said this, Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Now, how did the Jews interpret that? 
Did they interpret that once or twice a year, the high Sabbath? No. Did they interpret that one Saturday a month? No. When God said, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, what did they understand that to mean? Every Saturday that rolled around, every week out of Saturday, they remembered every Sabbath. All right, consider this. On the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. How many weeks have a first day? Every. What was the purpose Christians came together for? To remember the Lord's death, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. They came together every first day of the week to break bread. Friend, when we put all the information together, we can see that the Lord's Supper as an item of worship is something that Christians ought to remember every time they come together. Now, let me show you the inconsistency here. Let's say you go somewhere uh, this Sunday. When you go there, how many places are going to pass the collection plate? Everywhere you go. Why? Well, the language of 1 Corinthians 16 is nearly parallel to Acts 20. We understand it when it comes to the collection, but we can't get it when it comes to communion. Let me show you. Look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians 16. Look how parallel the language is. 1 Corinthians 16, look in your Bible in verses 1 and 2. Here's what the scripture says. Now concern the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day, and a lot of translations have this word, on the first day of every week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Why do, why do people take communion, uh, collection on the first day of the week? Because of the example of 1 Corinthians 16. What's it say? They came together, first day of the week, to lay something aside. When it comes to the collection, we can understand that's every first day of the week. Why can we not understand that when it comes to the Lord's Supper? They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Do you see the parallels there and the inconsistency? Christians, by this example, Christians are authorized to take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, and that's what we ought to do, just as the church did then. Now, as Paul is about to prepare to go further in preaching the gospel, he now is on the beach at Miletus with the elders who have traveled from Ephesus to meet up with Paul, and he is going to give them some encouraging words to help these elders and to help the church in Ephesus, where the uproar was and where they burned their magic books and where they're filled with immorality. And so what things does Paul say to these elders at Ephesus? He says, first of all, don't ever, ever withhold preaching the whole counsel of God. Look at Acts 20, verse 20, and Acts 20, verse 27. Paul says to these elders, I kept back nothing that was helpful to you, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Now jump down to verse 27. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Preach the word, the Bible says. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers. Friend, Paul says to these elders at Ephesus, I didn't hold back anything helpful. I didn't shun to preach the whole counsel of God to you. And for the church to grow and be what God wants it to be, all of God's word. We can't pick and choose, can't say what we like and what we don't like. The whole counsel of God. Elders must insist that the whole counsel of God be taught. Why is that? Because the elders are responsible for feeding the flock. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. Paul says to the elders in Ephesus, Therefore take heed to yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The elders in the Lord's church today especially, we say how thankful we are for every congregation that has good, faithful elders. What a great responsibility it is. You're responsible for people's souls. Hebrews 13 verse 7. We want that work to be a joy as the writer there mentions, but what a great responsibility and privilege it is as well to shepherd, to feed 
to encourage. You've got you've to watch out for the flock, just like a shepherd watches out for a sheep. You're responsible for making sure that what they're taught and what they're fed is the whole counsel of God. And then you have to lead them. Just as a shepherd leads his flock, as a leader of God's people, you have a great privilege and responsibility. And so we want to encourage elders in the Lord's church everywhere to rise up to that great a privilege and to be the kind of men God wants you to be. Then as we think about Acts chapter 20, there are a couple of other things we want you to see. From Paul's words of encouragement to the elders at Ephesus, some things really stand out. Look at Acts chapter 20. How's the church? How are Christians? How are we going to be built up today? Look at Acts 20 verse 32. As Paul gathers with these elders, he kind of concludes by saying, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. If we're going to be built up and if we're going to receive that inheritance, friend, it's by the word of God. You see, the word of God is God's power to save. Romans 1.16 the, the, the Bible is not a dead, dusty, old book that doesn't relate. It's living and it's powerful. It, it, it's like the rock that breaks the hammer. It's like the fire that, that, that burns out the things that ought not to be there. Jeremiah 22, verse 29, when people receive with meekness the implanted word, it's able to save their soul. And men and women are born again today by listening to and obeying. The Word of God, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 25. And so in our congregations today, how we need to put the emphasis on what God says. We need to say what God says and let a thus saith the Lord be the final matter on all things. Now, in Acts 20, there's something interesting you find. In Acts 20, verse 35, we find the only words of Jesus that are not found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or to the seven letters of the congregations in Asia Minor. Look in Acts 20, verse 35. This is a beautiful statement. I hope you don't miss this. Acts 20, verse 35. And Paul says, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Now watch this. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You know, Jesus didn't have to say that for it to be true. I'm thankful he did. He didn't have to say it because I saw it in his life every day. Didn't you? When you read about the story of Jesus and you read about he didn't even have the place to call his own. When you read about him walking miles every day to teach the gospel. You read about him being called Beelzebub for doing good. When you read about him you know, suffering and dying and everything he faced. Jesus not just said it's more blessed to give than is received. He lived that every day. And friend, isn't that how we ought to live every day? It's more blessed to be a giver than it is to be a taker, right? I wonder sometimes if we aren't raising a generation that's just the opposite. I wonder if we haven't raised a generation of people with their hand out who were kind of takers instead of givers. You, won't you, will, you will never be as happy as a taker as you will be as a giver. The greatest gift you could ever give is to be a giver, to help other people, to do good, to look for ways every day that you can impact people's lives for good and spend yourself in the cause of Christ every day. Let's then turn our attention for our time remaining in Acts chapter 21 and 22. Paul now realizes that he is going to have to go to Rome in Acts 21. There's this vision that is seen uh, Paul is going to be bound in that vision. Uh, Agabus the prophet realizes that and it, it breaks people's hearts. But Paul doesn't want it to slow down what he's doing. Look in Acts 21, verse number 14. So when, he would, when Paul would not be persuaded, we see say, the will of the Lord be done. Not everything we do has a, an outcome that we deem as positive physically. Paul was going to be bound. He was going to have to go to Rome. There would be consequences for that. He would very likely die for the cause of Christ. And that was clearly seen and showed in this vision and prophecy. And Paul said, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but to die for the cause of the Lord. And so they tried to persuade Paul, but when they couldn't, they said, may God's will be done. 
Friend, maybe, maybe that is God's will. Maybe God's will is that at times we have to suffer. And through our suffering, good can come, the gospel can be spread, and the ultimate plan of God can be further uh, put to a test. Now in Acts 22, let's turn our attention now to the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. In Acts 22, as Paul is brought before uh, the Jewish leaders, the Roman and Jewish leaders in that area, Paul is now given an opportunity to recount his own conversion. L let's recount that for just a moment. Acts chapter 9, uh, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, that man who's wreaking havoc on the church, is now headed down the road to Damascus with official letters that he finds any here of the way. He can bring them to Jerusalem and they'll be prosecuted. And so as he's traveling down that road, Paul's blinded by that great light. Voice comes down from heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul responds by saying, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. And then Saul asked, Lord, what would you have me to do? And do you remember next what the Lord said? You go into the city. It'll be told you what you must do. God sends Saul into the city to the street called Straight. Ananias, God's servant, is now sent to Saul of Tarsus to tell him what he must do to get right with God. He realizes Jesus is Lord. He realizes what he's been doing is wrong. He's blinded by that light, but he still needs to do something. There's a must that is missing there. Look at Acts 22, and I want you to see what Paul recounts Ananias saying to him that he had to do. Acts 22, verse 16. The Bible records these words. Actually, if you would, back up to verse 12. Then a certain Ananias a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will, and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now, why? Are you waiting? Arise, get up, and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. When the Lord told Saul, go into the city, and it'll be told you what you must do. And when Ananias came and said, why are you waiting? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That is what Paul had to do. And friend, that's what every person has to do to have their sins washed away. Question, at what point in verse 16 does the Bible say Paul's sins were washed away when he got up and was baptized? Baptism is the point at which sins are washed away. Why is it that point? Because the Bible teaches it's the death of Jesus that saves. Hebrews 9.22, it's the blood of Jesus that saves, right? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. He shed his precious blood that can forgive sins, and we are washed in that blood. Revelation 1.5, 1 Peter 1.18-20. 1, now, at what point? If it's the death of Jesus and the blood of Jesus that saves me from my sin, at what point does the Bible say I contact that blood? Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Paul said, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, don't miss this, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Friend, you cannot access the blood and the death and the sacrifice of Jesus without being baptized. The Bible teaches that's when we contact his death. That's why baptism is essential to salvation. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21 says, baptism does now also save us. Why? Because that's when we contact, number one, because God said so, and because that's where we contact the blood of Jesus. Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Acts 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized, 
for the remission of your sins. Jesus said, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. We're not talking about just one time here. The Bible over and over and over again teaches baptism is the culminating act where I contact the blood and the death of Jesus and it's where my sins are washed away. We repent and we're baptized. Why? Well, let's let God tell us. For the remission of sins. Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. And so my friend, as we've thought today about this study in Acts chapters 20 through 22, we can't help but ask the great question of the book of Acts. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Have you done what God says you must do in the book of Acts to be saved? Have you done what people in the first century did? to simply become Christians, nothing more, nothing less? Have you heard the message that Jesus is the Son of God? John 8, 24, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Have you believed in that message? Have you returned, have you turned away from a life of sin in repentance? Acts 3, verse 19, and have you been immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Friend, if you've not done those things and you've followed some other man-made plan, and then in all kindness and love, we say to you, you've not followed God's plan of salvation. You've not done all that God says you must do to be saved, and you're still outside of Christ and lost. Do we want that to be the case, or we have it? Of course not. God wants all men to be saved, and we do as well. But you can only be saved when you do what the Bible says. And so today, we're urging you, if you're not a New Testament Christian, you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, won't you do that today? If you'd like to study more about it, we can help you in any way, please contact us. And as always, study with us next time as we look more into the book of Acts. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.